glad you're with us tonight. We're going to press in, invite the Lord to come. We truly just want to uh, set our hearts before the Lord tonight in a posture of expectation of what the Lord will do when we gather together. So I'm going to invite anyone that wants to to go ahead and come up to the front here. You're welcome to worship up at the front or in your chair, wherever, wherever you'd like to. I just want to pray and ask the Lord to come and visit us, and then we'll jump in. Father, we love you tonight. We just set our hearts before you in thanksgiving and expectation of who you are. We thank you, Lord, that when we draw near to you, James 4 tells us that you draw near to us. And so we come with expectancy, with love, with gratitude. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. your hearts oh would you blow over us tonight yeah. come and blow over our garden
It's not of you, God. Clean it out. No, come purify us. Come sanctify us. We want what you have. So come and do what you want to do. Deliver us from every anxious, oppressive thought. We make space for you tonight. Let your will be done in our lives. Take our thoughts captive and we bring them into obedience to you. It feels like home with you, Father. I can rest here. Wherever we are, it feels like home with you, Father. Cause when we're rooted and grounded in your love, no winds can toss us, no winds can cause fear or anxiety in us. I won't be afraid. I won't be afraid. If at home in the Father, in the stronghold, Stronghold of the Father, safe at home with the Father. In the stronghold of the Father, safe at home with your Father. In the stronghold of the Father, safe at home with the Father. In the stronghold of the Father, safe at home with the Father. In the stronghold of the Father, safe at home. Stronghold of the Father, we're safe at home with the Father. Safe at home with the Father. We take refuge. We take refuge. Have your way. Have your way. Have 
of your way. us in that love tonight oh we would not be shaken we would not be found with anxiety or worry just as you called us to sing worthy worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Is worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you sing holy and holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show
be shaken, I will not be moved. Oh, and we would be once found building our house upon the rock of your love, building our house on you, the sure foundation of it all. for friends or oh, friends who will obey your commands oh here we are Lord oh here we are your beloved ones rooted and grounded in your love walking according to your commands here we are Lord come and visit us with your love so we can love like you God oh, transform us in one moment transform us with the power of your love and our hearts will not be troubled you lay in Zion a precious cornerstone we believe in and we will not make haste sing holy holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me I'll never leave you, I'll never turn my heart away, you are my only love. And in the darkness, where fear and doubt seem truer, I'll never turn away, I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you I'll never turn my heart away You are my only love And in the darkness Where fear and doubt seem truer I'll never turn away Help me God Help me God to love you help me God to love you take these weak and broken vows and make me yours Threaten to cool this flame of passion 
still I will reach for you And in the valley Until the shadows flee away I set my heart on you Help me God, help me God To love you Help me God
thank you for your faithful love we thank you that you are faithful and true we love you we love your ways we love your leadership it is perfect father come and root us and ground us in your love in your love for your son for the father for the spirit and for one another Lord, would you bind us together in your love as we abide in your love. Come, make us more like you. Release revelation in the preaching of your word tonight to each and every one of our hearts. That you would release new revelation of what it means to abide in you. What it means to abide in your love. Come and release revelation and wisdom by your spirit. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence in this place. Come and increase, even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, worship team. Well, remain standing and just take a moment and greet one another.
Okay, let's all, uh, let's all find our seats, please. Uh, we've got a handout for tonight. If you and, uh, would like a handout or don't have any, just go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, the ushers will be uh, getting them to you. Let's go ahead and keep your hands up. And uh, turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're looking tonight at the subject of uh, being called to abandoned love. As we started our series in John 15. You know, Mike's uh, sessions are going to be focusing a lot more on the line upon line, and in my session is going to be focused a bit more on just kind of hitting the themes that are found in these chapters. John 15. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, thank you that you uh, draw us near to you by your spirit. And Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would draw us even closer. Lord, we say yes to you. Lord, we set our hearts before you. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would cause the light of your spirit. Lord, to illumine our minds, to illumine our spirit, to illumine our emotions. Lord, you open up our eyes, Father, to your word. Lord, we want to see uh, things concerning you, your glory, your beauty, your majesty. Father, even in the hearing and the speaking of your word, Father, would you strengthen our hearts to say yes to you in a deeper way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was going to look at the first page. I just want to do it just a real uh, brief review from, from last week. Paragraph A, that uh, John 13 to 17, what Jesus is doing there, he is uh, envisioning, calling, and equipping the church of how to engage, how to interact with God in a dynamic way until we walk fully in what I call the five components of the love of God. And so Jesus, you know, in a lot of ways, what is happening in John 13 to 17, as you recall, the apostles, um, when it came to teaching, they only asked Jesus one thing in terms of uh, to be taught. They've asked him many questions, but in terms of saying, Lord, would you teach us this, it was really one question. It was the question, teach us how to pray. And in a lot of ways, I think the Lord is answering that question here. Again, he he answered it at first when he gave him the Lord's Prayer. But here in John 13 to 17, he's teaching them, he's instructing them of how to, how to interact with God. And the amazing thing is, is that he's not just teaching them how to interact with God. He's teaching them that they can interact with God in the exact same way that he did in his humanity. That, they, that we have the same access to God as, as he did uh, because of the... Uh, uh, because of the born-again experience. The other thing that's so amazing about this passage is that uh, these passages this, is that it's, it's, it's a foreign concept to them that they can interact with God in this way. Remember, in their mind, he's the God of Sinai, the God who came with fire and glory and power and all these different things, and he is that, but remember, um, he told them that they couldn't even come near the mountain unless they died. That is their paradigm of God. Their paradigm of God is not one that you draw near to uh, and much less him living inside of you and you and I living inside of him. And so Jesus is equipping them. He's teaching them. He's training them how to engage with God in order to fully walk in the five components of, uh, components of love. The subject of God's love, God's glory is very prevalent in these, these five chapters. And so here are some of these five components. We talked about them last week. It's God's love for God, walking in God's love for God, understanding that, experiencing that, walking in God's love for us, 
walking in God's love in us back towards him, God's love in us towards one another, and God's love in us for a hostile world through the apostolic witness. Paragraph B, John 14, 15, and 16, what is happening is in John 13, Jesus lays out the requirements. And the requirement in a nutshell is John 13 could be summed up in this reality, love one another. The, the, uh, the whole picture of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, um, he is in fact uh, prophesying I mean, there's lots of things that are going on in John 13. It's an amazing passage. But for our context tonight, he is, in fact, prophesying the new commandment. It turns out that the new commandment to love one another as, as, um, as, as Christ has loved us is the requirement to fulfill the destiny of the church that is prophesied in John 17, verses 21 to 26. The unity of the church the witness of the church, the glory of the church, the church loving Jesus the way the Father loves the Son, that, that, that these realities that are prophesied, the destiny of the church in John 17, 21 to 26, is, uh, the requirement for that destiny is John 13, 34, and 35. John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus essentially is equipping the church to walk out the requirement of John 13, 34, and 35 so that she can enter into her destiny of John 17, 21, and 26. I'm going to say this again. John 14 to 16, Jesus, I believe, is equipping the church of how to walk out the requirement of John 13, 34, and 35 so that the church can enter into the destiny that he prophesied in John 17, uh, 21 to 26. But in a nutshell, these five chapters, they are deeply and intimately connected. In fact, there's times when there are certain phrases that are being repeated where Jesus is actually pointing back to something that he said earlier and giving more detail, giving more insight, giving, uh, helping us understand more the implications of what he had said earlier. So paragraph B, in John 14, Jesus is teaching his disciples how by his death on the cross, you and I have full access to the Father's presence through spiritual union. He teaches us how through his death on the cross, because of his shed blood, that you and I have total access to the Father because of his work, not because of anything that we have done or will do, do we have access to the Father. We have access to the Father because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us access to the Father. It's the blood of Jesus by which we can stand in the presence of a holy God. It's by the blood of Christ that the Holy One of Israel can live and reside in us and we can reside in him, call him our home, and we be his home as well. And so the glory of the cross is, is a, it's a remarkable event, it's a remarkable reality, uh, not only in terms of forgiveness, though that is, praise the Lord for forgiveness, but the power to enable us to stand in the presence of a holy God. You know, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, he says, therefore, let us enter the holiest of all with confidence through the blood. The blood of Jesus is the thing that gives us confidence to, uh, to stand before God. Um, too many believers have uh, their confidence before God based upon how their week went. Have a good week, read the right chapters, stayed away from this and that and the other, 
Now I got confidence before God. And the Lord goes, no, I don't want your confidence to be in how your week went. The, the, our confidence in his presence comes through his blood, not only for salvation. It will always be our confidence. It will always be our confidence. There's a lot that the Lord, I believe, wants us to understand about the blood. We don't have time to talk about it tonight, but for instance, the very well-known passage in Revelation chapter 12, is that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto death. This thing about the blood of Jesus will become critical as the uh, end times, the end of the age unfolds because it's going to be key to the church overcoming. It is through spiritual union, the grace of the Father, and his power released in our hearts to fulfill what is required. John 15, Jesus is now instructing his disciples, instructing his church, that it is essential to actively engage or abide in the relationship in order to bear fruit. And so, John 13, here's the requirement. John 14, here's the access. John 15, here's what we do with the access that we have. And that there is fruit that we are to bear in our lives. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. And that by this fruit, the Father is glorified. But then Jesus says, it is absolutely impossible to bear fruit unless we are actively accessing the presence of God of John 14. And as I've said before, the, the thing that is so amazing about this thing called engaging with God, it is simply speaking words, simple phrases to the Lord. And I just, uh, just love the, the phrases that Mike has talked about that is just simply expressing gratitude. Lord, thank you for this. Show me more. I mean, the Holy Spirit in, John, in James 4 or 5 says that he's eager he eagerly is awaiting. He is jealous to, to give us a greater grace. I really believe that the Spirit is eagerly sitting at the doors of our heart, just ready to engage us if we would only simply ask him simple things. Lord, thank you for loving me. Would you show me more? Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Show me more, Lord. Father, thank you that you love your son. Show me more. I mean, it's just those simple phrases. And we can do them in, a, uh, in an environment where we're focused. We, we're sitting in our chair, and that's what we do for a little bit. But we can also do, but not only that, we can do it in the car. We can do it tonight when we're done. We can just, as we're walking through the car, if, just take five seconds. But just these little phrases throughout the day. Yes, we have moments set aside so where, we, where we can focus on the word. But just throughout the day, just the speaking of simple phrases, uh, there is a power dimension that is released upon the heart. The thing, it, it never ceases to amaze me in my own life that if I get myself into a, um, into a swirl, which is charismatic for being in the flesh, uh, you know, when I use the strength of my own resolve to get out of that rut, it never ceases to amaze me how sometimes it just takes days. And it's just not fun. But when I actually take a moment and pause and just to speak simple phrases to the Lord, it just never ceases to me. It doesn't happen immediately, but something throughout the day begins to shift on the inside. And so when we're talking about abiding, it's a huge concept, massive implication, but in terms of the application for us, it really is as simple as us speaking words, and that's why I call it so insultingly simple. It's, it, it is an insult to our social status, our economic abilities, our talents, our giftings, our abilities. It's, it's the Lord, surely you, you would offer us something that we're, where we would use the fullness of our abilities to attain it. The Lord goes, no. He goes, he, he, he says, I want no flesh to glory in my presence. Anyone can do this, speaking simple phrases. And so John 14, access to God. John 4, 15, this is how we access him, by abiding, by speaking really simple phrases to the Lord. And then in um, John 16, he highlights how the church will function as a witness of God's love 
to a hostile world. How the church will function as a witness of God's love to a hostile world. Paragraph C, the Trinity is seen um, in each chapter of this discourse. In fact, one of the things that Jesus highlights, he highlights the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and then how you and I have been brought into that inner circle, that divine inner circle. We, we've been brought into that relationship. It, it's absolutely remarkable, remarkable to think about. And many passages throughout the, Old, throughout the New Testament that actually speak of this reality. One of my favorite ones is 1 John, where, the, uh, where John says, that which we have seen, handled, and touched concerning the word of life, we have declared it to you that you may have fellowship with us. And so John is saying, look, we've seen the Christ we have declared him to you that you might have relationship, that you might have community, that you might have an interaction with us, that you might be in relationship with us, he says. And then in verse 3, he says, and this is our fellowship. It's with the Father and with the Son. That's the community that we're a part of. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, it talks about that we've been called into the fellowship of the Son, the fellowship of the Son is speaking about the Trinity. It's speaking about this relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And you and I have been brought into that relationship. And we can interact with them as much as we want. We can interact with the Father, with the Son, with the Spirit. Interact with the Father about the Son, with the Son about the Father, with the Spirit about the Father, the Father about the Spirit. I mean, there's so many directions that we can go and we can speak to them about each other. And then on top of that, there's scores of verses in the Bible that give us insight about what each person does because even though the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, each person has three very distinct roles working together towards the same purpose, which is what the, uh, uh, the scholar Robert Kaiser calls the, uh, the divine community of single action. And so the Trinity is seen in each chapter of this discourse, yet each person is more prominent than another in each chapter. And so John 14, though the, father, though the Son and the Spirit are highlighted, the, the one that's really brought forth in John 14 is the Father. In John 15, though we see the Father and the Spirit, the one that's really brought forth in John 15 is the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the one that's really highlighted and brought forth in more prominence in John 16, where we see their role and how they relate with us as we relate with them and partner with them in terms of the manifestation of God's power and God's purpose in the earth. Paragraph D. John 15 focuses on abiding as the key to a victorious and a vibrant Christian life. In other words, to say this, I say this negatively, there is no way to live victoriously or have any vibrancy in our, uh, in our inner man aside from abiding. In other words, Jesus wants to give us something and walk in something when the music stops. I promised myself I was going to behave. <laughs> no, really, yeah, he wants to give us something that, that's real when the music stops. And again, and it happens by talking to him, interacting with him. It's a vibrancy. In fact, in John 15, he says that these things, verse 11, he says, these things I've spoken to you that your joy may be full. That's what I mean by vibrant, where there is a joy inside of us from the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit that comes from interacting with him in a meaningful way. There are several uh, elements applicable to the fruitfulness that we bear, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments, but in the immediate context, the, uh, the fruitfulness that we're called to bear, I believe, is the fruit of, uh, to bear, uh, excuse me, is the fruit of love. And, and very specifically, even, I would say, a forgiving love. Love that is ultimately inward and the outward manifestation. 
is a supernatural work of God on our hearts. Jesus links the bearing of fruit in John 15. I got the verses right there. He links the bearing of fruit to the keeping of his commandments. And then he tells us that the keeping of, of his commandments is to love one another. And so within the immediate context, when Jesus says, I want you to bear fruit, the fruit he wants us to bear is that we would love one another. Well, guess what? That's what he said in John 13. John 13, 34, 35, it says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And the guys go, wow, that's great. I, I want to love my brother. He goes, no, I want you to love your brother in the exact same way that I have loved you. And he goes, that's impossible. He goes, you're getting it. He goes, then what? He goes, well, let me tell you about the access that you can have to my father. And then he goes, now let me tell you what you need to do with this access. Talk to me, because when you talk to me, you will bear fruit. Well, what fruit? To keep my commandment. What commandment? This commandment is this, that you love one another. Oh, so we have to abide in order to do John 13, 34, and 35. Jesus goes, yes. That's the fruit I want you to bear. Jesus called his people to love one another as he loves us. And this, later on in John 15, 17 to 18, includes the loving of our adversaries. And that is something that does not come natural to the human psyche and to the human heart. In fact, Jesus talks about it. He says, look, and later on he says, look, if you were of the world, he goes, they would have loved you. He goes, it's easy to love your neighbor in that regard. He goes, but I say to you, love your enemy. It takes the supernatural work of God that comes through abiding. Let's go to page two. So last week, we just kind of focused on uh, John 15, verses one to six. And we, were kind of, we were kind of looking at those themes. And uh, tonight, we're going to look kind of like a general sense of what he's talking about in John 15, verses 7 to 17. Abiding, yielding more fully to him. Again, in John 13 to 17, each of the five chapters, they built on each other. Each following, the cha each following chapter and reinforces the other and, expound, and, and they expound on each other. Um, a neat little exercise, so for those of you who are interested, is um, you can go to, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Bible Gateway, and, uh, and just cut paste the entire five chapters and just put it on a Word document, put it on a Word document, and get rid of all the chapter numbers, chapter headings, verse numbers, and it's just pure text, and I just read it. In one setting, look for themes, look for contrast, look for repetition. It will shock you, the things that are, uh, that are found there. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, they're all deeply connected to each other in a very, very, very powerful way. So for those of you who geek out on documents and colors and stuff, this is for you. The rest of you, amen, let's stand. <laughs> in John 14... Uh, Jesus, again, he lays the foundation of our spiritual union with the Father. Can't say enough about this spiritual union. It is what the new covenant is about, beloved. The new covenant. The new covenant, the covenant that God made with us was through the cross, through the shed blood of his son, that by faith through grace, the Spirit of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit would come and take residence inside of you and me. This, beloved, this is radical. You know, we're so accustomed to the phrase, well, I ask Jesus in my heart, the Lord goes, it's way more intense than this. Ask Jesus in my heart. He goes, you were dead on the inside. Completely dead. Unable to respond to God. And through the born again experience, we were quickened. And God took residence inside of us. First Peter says that we were born again through incorruptible seed. The life-giving seed of God took residence inside of you and me. 
The power, Hebrews 7.25, the, the power of the indestructible life took residence inside of us. It's radical beyond anything. In fact, it is so radical that the epistles, Ephesians uh, 1 to 3, Colossians 1 to 3, Romans 1 through 12, I mean, all these passages, they are literally expounding on the implications of what it means to be born again. And helping the church to reorient our thinking to what we have been brought into by the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says that the Spirit, he longs to reveal to us and help us understand the things that have been freely given to us by God. And Paul talks about Ephesians 1, 13, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, that he was given to us as a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. What he's saying is that the Spirit was given to us for that purpose, to teach us, to instruct us, to convince us, to help us understand the inheritance that we have. Unfortunately, the Holy Spirit has been kind of reduced to a charismatic, you know, charismatic, you know, uh, you know feathered to kind of tickle us at the end of the service. And beloved, there is so much more to the Holy Spirit than God's tickle feather. (laughs) No, I'm being for real. He is a third person of the Trinity, God, very God, light, very light. He is God himself, the uncreated. And he's been given to us by God, the Father, proceeding from the Son to instruct us, and Jesus said that. He says, look, I'm going to send you the helper, and he's going to remind you of the things that I taught you. Now, again, there's lots of things that can be applied to that, applied to that but in the immediate context of John 14, what he says, he goes, I'm teaching you all this stuff about how I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and you and me, and I and them, and, and all of this stuff. He goes, and I'm, he said, I know it's a lot. He said, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and one of his main jobs is to teach you and I about the glory of the new covenant. To convince us, to teach us, to instruct us. It's absolutely amazing. And so this foundation of our spiritual union, beloved, it is critical. And I really believe that as the days and the years and the decades unfold, that before the Lord returns, The church is going to really grab a hold um, of this truth. It's absolutely amazing. In fact, Jesus says that, John 14, 12, he says, to the people who believe this truth, he says, greater works than these shall they do. In the realm of power that the church will walk in because they believe that we are in union with Christ, as Christ is in union with his Father. It's absolutely amazing. Again, John 15, he then instructs us how to apply, how to engage with this truth. Paragraph B, one of the main themes of John 13 to 17 is the reality of God's glory, the Father's glory. That's one of the main themes we find in these five chapters. God's glory, uh, 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 the Son's desire to have the Father glorified. Glorified in us, glorified through us. In John 17, 1, Father, the hour has come. Now glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. John 15, when he talks about a bare fruit, by this the Father is glorified. Now, we talk a lot about glory and glorified, and it's so, uh, we're so accustomed to using the phrase that we seldom stop to think what it is that the word actually means. God's glory refers to three very basic things. It it refers to the unfolding of his attributes or his character. Or the way I like to say it, it it is the revelation of his personality, knowing what he is like. So when we're talking about God's glory, we're talking about the revealing of who he is. Secondly, 
It is the understanding of his administration or the understanding of his plan and of his purpose. One of the things that's so amazing about God is this, is that God is what he does and what he does is who he is. I think I lost some of you there. One of the things that are amazing about God is who he is is what he does. And what he does is who he is. I'll give you an example. You and I know that God is a warrior because we read books about it or we read a Bible verse, right? But do you know that the people who said that God was a warrior had never read about the fact that God was a warrior and yet they knew that he was a warrior? Well, the reason why they knew that he was a warrior was because he destroyed an entire army. <laughs> and so when the Lord, with his power, spread the Red Sea, Wide open, and it walked right through, and the most powerful military at that time walks through the Red Sea, and the Red Sea closes up and drowns Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's army. The people go, I think he's a warrior. <laughs> they knew who he was because of what he did. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament, that they begin to know who he was. Because of what he did. They knew that he was Jehovah Jireh because of the, 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 uh, the land that was provided when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. They knew that he was Jehovah Rapha because of the healing or rather, it's kind of complicated, but the, the, what he tells them is that you will know that I'm the God that heals because you will see that the sicknesses actually won't touch you. And so it wasn't just about the removing of sickness. It was about sickness not touching people. And when they saw that, they went, oh, you're Jehovah Jireh. I mean, jo uh, Jehovah Rapha. Who God is is what he does. And what he does is who he is. And so when we're talking about the glory of God. We're talking about the revealing of his attributes, his personality, but we're also talking about the understanding of his person. In Psalm 106, verse 9, it says that God did wonders in the days of Egypt, but the people did not understand his wonders. Jesus says in John, several occasions, he said, look, if you don't believe me, at least believe the works that I'm doing, for they testify about me. And so the understanding of the attributes of God and the understanding of the works of God is part of the understanding of God's glory. Lastly, is the power of God. The manifestation of his power shows us who he is. It shows us things, again, about his personality, his power, and his purpose. The fruit that Jesus, paragraph B, the last sentence there, the fruit that Jesus calls us to bear is for that very purpose. The fruit that is born in our lives reflects the glory of God. It reflects his attributes, it reflects his administration, his work, and it reflects his power. Because when Fruit is born in our lives, what it does, it brings a greater understanding of the Father. You know, I remember some years ago, I'm um, here at the IHOP, there was uh, uh, one of our staff that uh, uh, was uh, getting married, and uh, um, he had some family members that came from out of town for the wedding, they were from overseas, so they, so they came here for about a week or two, and uh, uh, a good number of them actually did not know the Lord. In fact, um, uh, some of them were, were atheists. And, uh, you know, so they're here in our midst and they are, uh, you know, they're, they're around my friend and, and, uh, and, 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 and all of our friends. So they're, they're kind of interacting with the community and they're seeing, you know, the, the, the community is taking place until one of his aunts literally walked up to him right before he left. 
before they left. And they said, this is what they said to them. They, this is what they said to them. They looked him in the eye and they said, they said, I now know, believe that God exists because of the way these people love you. That's literally what they said. They, were, they, they went from atheist to agnostic because of the love that they were seeing taking place in my friend's life from his friends, you know, that, that whole dynamic. I now believe that God exists because of the way these people love you. And so the fruit brings people into a greater understanding of who the Father is. Paragraph C, it is in a place of interacting with God through his word that we have the promise that he hears us. He says, abide in me and my words abide in you You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, that's a bit of a, you know, uh, uh, that's one of those Mufasa verses where you're kind of like, I don't know. Is it really saying what it's saying? No, I know what it's saying. What it's saying is if you abide in the Lord and you abide in his word, he will put his desires in you, and then you ask what he really wants, but he makes you think it's yours, and then, no, 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 that is way too complicated. It just straight up says, you abide in God, abide in the word, you ask what you want, and he'll do it for you. But Jesus throws in a little hint in verse 8. He goes, if I was you, I'd ask for fruit. <laughs> That's the, that's, the, that's the message there. Abide in me, abide in, in my word, ask what you desire, and you'll be surprised. But if I was you, ask for fruit. We can ask the Father for anything, Jesus says. Anything we want, and he will respond. By the way, that's very terrifying. One of the most terrifying verses in the Bible for me, it, it terrifies me when I think about it, is Psalm 145. It says, he will satisfy the desire of every living thing. In other words, at the end of the day, you will get what you want. It's terrifying to think about. <clears throat> well, paragraph D Spiritually speaking, hunger begets hunger, and the rich gets, get richer in the spirit. Jesus says in a verse uh, 8, let's look at verse 7 again. He says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, the Father is glorified That's the hint, right? By this the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Now, it sounds like he's saying that we are not as disciples until we bear fruit. And that is not what's going on because it's clear that the guys that he's talking to, they already are following him. They already are his disciples. In fact, er early on he said that, he says, you are already clean. So then what is Jesus talking about? What does it mean when he says, by this the Father is glorified that you will bear fruit so that you would be my disciples. Well, I think what is happening here is that Jesus is showing us this, this principle of the Spirit that hunger begets hunger and the rich get richer in the realm of the Spirit. That as we remain active, paragraph D, as we remain active in engaging the Lord through simple dialogue, here it is, and a spirit of obedience, the result is a greater desire in us to yield to him with more obedience and love. In other words, when we bear the fruit of loving one another, Jesus is saying the thing that hap- what happens inside of us, we actually become all the more disciples of him. We already are disciples of him, but when we begin to bear fruit, we become disciples of him all the more. And then we bear fruit and we become disciples all the more. And that's why I titled this message, Abandoned Love. That we grow deeper and deeper in the experiential union and obedience and fruit bearing with Christ. We begin to ask, again, you know, that famous question that kind of roams around here for the last 20 years. How far will you let me go 
How abandoned will you let me be? That is a question that is awakened inside the heart that abides and bears the fruit of obedient love. So look at that verse again there, John 15, 8. By this the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit in so or in order that you will be my disciples. In parentheses there, obedient love produces a greater desire to follow Jesus and to obey him. Paragraph E. The fruit that we are called to bear, again in the context of John 15, we talked about it earlier, is the fruit of forgiving love. However, it is not limited to that. It's not limited to that. We are also called to bear the fruit of obedient love. Where we walk out holiness. We walk out the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus wants love that's rooted in a spirit of obedience. And I say spirit of obedience because there's a yes in our heart and there is a wholehearted leaning into to obey him even though we fall short in the process. That's why I call it a spirit of obedience. Uh, Where we encounter him, we experience his love with the full intent to follow him and to obey him. That's what I mean by the spirit of obedience. Jesus wants love rooted in a spirit of obedience that further enhances the experience of love. It enhances the experience of love. We don't earn the love. The love is there. He loves us freely. It's who he is. It's God is love. But the experience of love enhances in the context of the spirit of obedience. And that's, I believe, what he means by in John fifteen ten when he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I've kept my Father's commandment and abide in his. Paragraph F. The fruit that we bear also includes the impact of our ministry. And so the fruit, you know, could be in some ways threefold. Forgiving love, number one. Number two, obedient love. And thirdly, ministry impact. But here's the ministry impact. The impact is calling others to walk in that same quality of obedient love. And so most people, when they think about impact, they think about size. But I believe when God thinks about impact, he thinks about quality. That when he evaluates our ministry impact, The thing that he evaluates is the quality or, yeah, the quality that's been produced in the life that we've touched through our preaching and through our serving. I say this again. When Jesus evaluates our ministry impact, he's evaluating the quality. In other words, the depth of the yes that is produced in the lives of those that we've preached to, discipled, mentored, served. He goes, when he measures the impact, he doesn't measure the size, but I believe he measures the quality. Different ones have been apportioned, uh, different size, different spheres, but that's just been given by the Lord. That is not what we get evaluated on. We get evaluated how much of the quality of forgiving love and obedient love is produced in those who hear our words and have been touched by our lives. The quality, paragraph F, the quality of ministry is based on what I call the gospel metric. The gospel is the metric by which God evaluates our ministry impact. The gospel metric that our preaching and service to others produces a largeness of heart and obedient love in others. He will not assess the largeness of our following, but he will assess gospel fruit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're talking about the, the judgment seat of Christ. 
He says, if anyone's work, instead of work, we can say fruit. If anyone's fruit, which he has built on it, endures, he will be rewarded. If anyone's work or fruit is burned, he will suffer loss. And we see that in, in John 15, 6. But he himself is saved, yet as though by fire. And so we're talking about, we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about living a life of abiding where we can bear fruit that remains. And if we don't bear the fruit that remains, we will be saved as though by fire, which means we'll be saved, but our life has been wasted. Romans uh, 1.13, Paul talks to the Romans, he says, that I might have some fruit among you also just as I did among the other Gentiles. He's wanting to come to Rome to minister the gospel to them unto producing, I believe, this obedient love in their hearts in a deeper way. Let's go to page three. I love this quote from von Balthasar. He says, when you say yes to God unconditionally, you have no idea how far this yes is going to take you. And we say yes to God unconditionally. We have no idea how far this yes is going to take us. Paragraph three, abiding in the Father's love and the spirit of obedience. Again, in John 15, 8, Jesus taught an important principle, which is that the only way that we can stoke and cultivate spiritual hunger is through the spirit of obedience. That's what he's saying in John 15, 8. 15, 8, excuse me. The only way we can stoke and cultivate spiritual hunger, where it grows, where 5, 10, 20 years later, we are more hungry than we were when we started, is by the spirit of obedience. By this the Father is glorified, so that you would bear fruit, that you may be my disciples, he says. Now, essential, again, essential to greater hunger is bearing the fruit of obedient love. I'll say this again. Essential to growing in spiritual hunger is the fruit of obedient love. Now, the Apostle Peter, we'll look at a passage, go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, the Apostle Peter, he taught the early church, this principle with great zeal. Great zeal. In uh, Second Peter, I'll go there myself as well. Second Peter chapter one. What Peter taught, he taught that there is a multiplication of God's presence and power on the heart. When he says grace and peace multiplied, he's talking about the multiplication of the experience of God's presence and power upon the heart. And he says that it comes through the knowledge of God. I put in the notes experiential knowledge of God. It's not... The, the, just the collecting of data, it is actually the, the growing in the experience. It's intimacy, knowing, instead of the knowledge of God, you can say knowing God. In other words, grace and peace be multiplied to you as you get to know God better. That's what he's saying. This experiential knowledge of God, that's in verses uh, two to three. And he says that through the privilege and the power of spiritual union, we have the ability to walk free from the power of sin. Say this again, that through the privilege and the power of spiritual union, you and I as born again believers, we have the ability to walk free from the power of sins and the effects of sin in our lives. That's what he's saying in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, verse 4. However, he continues in verses five to seven, and what he tells us is that 
It is not enough to encounter the presence of God. He says that the encountering of God's presence, he says it is important that we go on and engage the Lord with a spirit of obedience or with a yes in our hearts and diligently seek to obey his ways. So he says, paragraph C, that when we add the spirit of obedience in responding to his grace, Peter tells us that we are assured that we will cultivate a vibrant and a fruitful Christian life. Here's what he says. Grace and peace be multiplied to you, verse 2, that to you in the knowledge of God or knowing God in the Lord Jesus Christ. As his divine power or his grace has been given to us all pertaining to life and godliness through, again, knowing him who called us by virtue and glory. Verse four, by which have been given to us exceedingly great promises, uh, excuse me, great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of his divine nature, that's spiritual union, us being in him and him being in us, partakers of the divine, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's some good Shanda Mahandai. Okay? It's like, okay, I'm in. This is awesome. And Peter goes, continues, he says, but, verse 5, it has to be coupled with a spirit of obedience. Look what he says. But, also for this very reason. What reason? For the reason of having uh, been encountered by the knowledge of God. Uh, for the very reason that we have this spiritual union with God, he says, for this reason, here's, here's that word. He goes, give all diligence, he says. In other words, we must be intentional about this. Moment by moment, so to speak. It takes thought. It takes forethought. It takes intentionality. He says, Give all diligence to add to your faith virtue. It's moral character. To your virtue, he says, add knowledge. Again, continue in that place of encounter. He goes to knowledge, add discipline or self-control. He goes to your self-control, now you got to persevere in that self-control. He goes to, in that perseverance, he goes at godliness because perseverance, that's what it does. It, it produces character inside of us. Verse seven, to godliness, he goes brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. I mean, it's quite a list. But he's talking about the spirit of obedience. He goes, we encounter the Lord. We have union with him. We've got the power in us to escape the lust of this world, he says, but in order to have a vibrant spiritual life, we have to, it has to be coupled with the spirit of obedience. And he gives, you know, five, six, seven, he gives us what the spirit of obedience looks like. And, you know, the Sermon on the Mount fits in this. There's many, many passages that fit this truth. But here's what I want you to notice. Look at verse eight. He says, for if these things are yours and abounds, can someone tell me, I know this is a big crowd here. What these things are is verses five, six, and seven, right? If these things are yours and abound, and remember this phrase, these things, because these things is going to show up a lot here uh, from, from here on out in this passage. He said, if these things are yours, in other words, you own them, he says, and they abound. In other words, you're growing in these things. Look what he says. If these things are yours and abound, you will neither, hear this, be barren nor unfruitful. And so it, is, it has to be encounter connected with the spirit of obedience. He says, you will neither be unfruitful, here it is, in the experience of knowing Christ. We go, okay. And Peter continues, verse 9, look what he says. 
He says, for he who lacks these things, we've already established what these things are, right? He said, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was once cleansed from his old sins. Peter continues in verse 10. This is a powerful passage. He says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. It's like, oh, man, like how much more diligence is there? He goes, he goes there's diligence and then there's more diligence. He says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Here it is again. For, listen to this. For if you do these things, you will what? Never stumble. As someone once pointed out to me that the original language there is a double negative. He goes, if these things are yours, you will never, ever stumble. This is intense stuff. But, but Peter's talking about abiding in the love of God, in the grace of God, with the spirit of obedience. Well, Peter isn't done yet, because I said earlier that Peter was teaching the church this point with great zeal. Now, let's look at Peter's zeal to teach this point. Verse 12 he says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. As I mentioned earlier, these things is going to show up over and over. He says, I will not be negligent. Peter says, I will be intentional. I will be focused. I will be determined to teach you these things even though you know and are already established in them. You know, because that one guy in the back row says, but I already know all this stuff. Peter goes, it doesn't matter. Because even though you know this stuff, and this really, will, oh, Lord Jesus, this, this will really get us in, in a trouble because we like that, that new fresh revelation. We like that, that you know, that ooh-wee-woo stuff. <laughs> the apostle Peter shows up and he goes, nah, I want to talk about abiding, and I want to talk about brotherly kindness, faith, virtue, perseverance, love, because that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, but tell me about that one, you know, that third eye and that big heaven that stares that went up through the fifth wing of the feather. And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, no. He goes, he goes, he goes, there's that too, but that's not, he goes, no. He goes, I want to talk about abiding in Christ experiencing his presence, understanding the wealth of spiritual union in the context of a spirit of, obe of, of, of obedience because when you have obedience, he goes, you won't be barren and you won't be unfruitful. If you don't have these things, he goes, you will, trust me, you will get spiritual amnesia and you will forget where you come from. He goes, and if you have a, if you have a spirit of obedience in the place of abiding, he goes, you will secure yourself to never ever stumble. And he says, and I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things even though you know this stuff. Well, it's about to get even more intense. You're like, really? He said, oh, yeah, watch this. Peter goes, yes, I think that's right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's some dude in the back goes, oh, you got to be kidding me. Really? Peter goes, yes, it's right. He goes, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, because he says, as long as I am alive, I will remind you of these things. Some guy goes, well, at least it's while he's still alive. Peter goes, uh-uh. Verse 15. Listen, listen, watch, watch this. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after I am dead. This brother is determined. <laughs> That's how important this is. Abiding with a spirit of obedience. He goes, my entire ministry, he goes, I will remind you. You know, you know one guy goes, man, finally when this, he's gone, we'll get some of the Shonda Hyundai stuff. He goes, nope. 
He goes, I have an entire leadership team trained up because after I'm gone, they're going to remind you of these things. Like, oh, you're going to be kidding me. <laughs> so important is the spirit of obedience in the context of abiding that Peter committed himself to speaking about it often and he ensured that this message would continue even after his death. Again, Jesus taught that the Father's love was coupled with obedience. And he simply, paragraph, he simply sums it up, obeying him with committing to love one another. Galatians 5.14, let's have the worship team come up. Galatians 5.14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. At paragraph F, this is for your own study, the love, of, uh, love is who God is. God is love. Therefore, his love is vast. And the love of God is found in understanding a whole series of things. And the reason why I have this list over there is because when we think about the love of God, we, it is very tempting to immediately just to reduce it towards natural sentiment. And yes, there is the experience of the love of God upon the heart. The pleasures of God, the delights of God that touch us, that, that river that abides inside of us. It's absolutely amazing. There is a stream the, whose rivers make glad. The, uh, there's a river me, whose, whose streams make glad the city of God. The, and so there is the emotional component to this for sure. But I believe there is insight in the scripture about the love of God that actually enhances the experience of it. And there are many passages. Number one, for instance, uh, one of them is understanding the death of Christ. Where Paul says, the Bible tells us that God's love was shown to us in the death of Christ. Here's one. The giving of the book of Revelation to Jesus was the love of God. In John 5.20, it says that because the Father loves the Son, he shows him all things. Our desire to receive Christ and to, and to experience more of Christ. If you're tonight and you're finding yourself stirred you know, over the last couple of weeks, I said, man, I want more. Although that is the operation of the love of God inside of you. Having confidence in the hope to come. For well, love does not disappoint. It gives us hope. The resurrection of the saints is the revelation of God's love. Compelling us to not live for ourselves shows us the revelation of God's love. Understanding that all things belong to Jesus is the revelation of God's love. And so the scripture gives us so much insight in each one of these topics. Father, thank you. Show me more. <laughs> That's all we got to do. Father, thank you. Show me more. Thank you that Jesus died. Show me more. Thank you gave you Sunday book of Revelation. Show me more. Thank you that we'll be resurrected from the dead. Show me more. Thank you that you're compelling us to no longer live for ourselves. Show me more. I mean, there's, it is the beloved, it is that simple. Amen. I invite you to stand. Now, praise the Lord is right. You know, uh, some of you are going, you know what? Just uh, here in the last week or two, a month or so, I've just been feeling just in my heart just to really just say, you know what? I want to lock in with the Lord just in a, in a new way. And, and by locking in, I mean where there's a renewed heart engagement with the Lord. A renewed heart engagement with the Lord. If that is you and you like to see prayers, I want to invite you to come to the front. And I know we all want more of Jesus, but I'm talking about just that, that real 
accentuated, that pronounced. I mean, you, you're like, man, the spirit is really tugging me. Really tugging me to lock in with Jesus. Again, by lock in, I mean the, the, the internal dialogue with the Lord. Just to have a renewed focus with the Lord. And the Lord, I believe, just wants to uh, touch your heart with grace. And believe, again, in the simplicity of it all. It's really speaking these simple phrases. For some of you, it's going to be as simple as, you know, because the temptation is to go, I'm going to read 100 chapters a day and all kinds of no, for some of you, it's going to be as simple as this. I'm going to be intentional throughout the day to just to stop and pause, even if it's for 30 seconds, a couple of 30 seconds here and there throughout the day, and I'm going to engage with the Lord in that focused way. Father, thank you. Show me more. Just to whisper small phrases to the Lord and then see what happens over time. The hunger will increase. For some of you, um, you've been stuck in some form of compromise. And a compromise uh, doesn't always have to be sexual because when we think compromise, our mind immediately goes there. Though there's that to here too. But for some of you, the compromise is related to your speech. For some of you, it's related to the eye gate, the thought life. For some of you, it's related to, the, to attitudes. Compromise is a wide range of things. And, and there's no guesswork in this because as you've been feeling the Lord tugging you to say, you know what, Lord, I want to lock in with you in a, in a more intensified way. There's also one area that you just know. He's got, it's, again, he's so kind. There's no guesswork. He just, we know what he's got his finger on in our lives. And we want to say yes to the Lord in that area. Say, Lord, I say yes. I say yes to the spirit of obedience in that area. So I want to invite the ministry team to come up and just uh, as the worship team leads us in worship, but just to ask the Lord to release His grace. Wisdom, open my eyes. Grace to respond in a deeper way. Spirit of revelation. Open my heart I don't believe this is because of his displeasure. It's nothing like that. This is love compelling you to draw near to him in a renewed way. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation. Open my heart again, spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again, spirit of revelation, open my heart, cause I want to see.
Teach us how to behold 
flames of fire, I know that your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice sounds like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful. I know that your eyes are like flames of fire, and I know that your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice it sounds like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful.